I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this very important conference where I have learned already a great deal, uh, particularly in looking at the presentations of these four uh, very illustrious professors in this subject. So in case you're asking, how can I turn this on? Why me? Why am I here? Well, I'm a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Fetus and Newborn. And as such, I am the lead author on the AAP policy statement, which is currently in process on planned home birth. This has taken quite a while. So with the possible exception of circumcision, <laughs> this may be the most emotional and least data-driven issue I've encountered in neonatology. And I think, you know, trying to figure this out, I think it's at least partly due to conflicts over control. Control of the process itself. Who does it belong to? Who's in charge of it? Who needs to help? Who needs to stay out of the way? Perceptions of beneficence versus autonomy. Who knows best? And on what basis do they know best? And opinions of relative value. What's really important to me may not be so important to you. And we may have different ways of looking at things. And all of this is going to determine how we approach the situation. Why such limited and flawed data? There are numerous reasons. But I think the first one is what you look for may determine what you find. We all come to things with our own backgrounds and our own ideas of what we're going to be finding. Therefore, we have strongly held opinions regarding the value of interventions and the value of the different outcomes that we're looking at leading to a lack of equipoise on all sides. In addition, it's very hard to gather, as you have become aware, reliable or complete data from splintered systems. And in the United States in particular, that's what we have. We have conflicting instead of cooperative structures. We have limited options for birth centers. You've seen how few there actually are in this country. We have great isolation of home birth providers. And in part, this is due to highly variable credentialing, highly variable backgrounds, people looking with suspicion at different ways of approaching a professional relationship. In addition, and I think one of the hardest points here is that it's often difficult or impossible to randomize. This is the same as with breastfeeding. You can't pull a card and say, OK, you're going to formula feed, you're going to breastfeed. And you can't pull a card and randomize a woman to home birth. So your populations are different in unknowable ways. You may be able to uh, adjust for socioeconomic status. You may be able to adjust for primate versus multip or for maternal education. But there will always be things you don't know. And until we have a randomized trial, which we don't have and can't probably ever have, you will not know. So first, Dr. Hodnett presented us the Cochrane Review on Alternative Birth Settings and Outcomes. And there was only one alternative with randomized controlled trials, a bedroom-like setting within a standard or an, alongside a standard obstetrical unit. This was associated with less intervention, fewer maternal complications, but a high transfer rate, one third to two thirds almost. And reassuringly, no change in perinatal death rate. She emphasized the difference between the place of a planned birth and the environment of the place. You may be giving birth in a hospital, but that hospital environment can be all the way from accommodating and friendly to sterile and very difficult. And I think it's particularly important because no matter what we do, the vast majority of women will be giving birth in a hospital setting, and we need to pay attention to that setting as well as others. And she emphasized we need to maybe switch our focus from changing individual behaviors to changing that environment. And that includes all the environments in which this is taking place. Dr. Sandel showed us the birthplace in England study, where they studied four separate things, home birth, freestanding midwifery units, alongside units, and compared them to hospital-based obstetric units. She found decreased obstetrical interventions and an increase in normal or non-intervened with births. But high transfer rates again. A quarter of all women and up to almost a half of primipers women were transferred out of those three settings into a standard setting. And they also did, discovered in their particular study that home birth had increased neonatal risk for first pregnancies. So I put asterisks around here because this is my takeaway from that, which is not all low risk pregnancies are the same. And we still have not got a really good way of figuring that out. 
And we need to address the high intervention rates in obstetric units and the low rates of normal birth. Again, looking at the environment of the place. Just because you're in a hospital doesn't mean you have to experience those interventions, which seem to be kind of standard for people who go there. Dr. Sakala from the Childbirth Connection talked to us about the process of care during childbirth and defined quality, the degree to which care services increase the likelihood of optimal health outcomes and are consistent with current knowledge. And I underline that because I would say to you, we have no current knowledge that's really very helpful, except that we need to do better. She asked lots of questions. What are the optimum principles and practices? What settings best implement those? What criteria to use to assess? And I think those are still unanswered questions as well. She expressed the precautionary principle, minimize deviation from mammalian heritage and exposure to interventions that do not offer a clear benefit. That sounds to me as a physician like first do no harm. I think we are all in agreement in what we need to do moving forward. We have different ideas about how to accomplish that end. The goal, and the goal of everyone who spoke here, I believe, is to, that we need an integrated system that provides a coordinate, coordinated consultation, collaboration, and transfer. Finally, Dr. Sternberg talked to, to us about the effects of the built environment on stress, that there are clear biochemical effects of stress on the neuroendocrine immune axis and health, and there are specific effects of birthing environments on those stress, health, and pain outcomes. I have a question for you here. As opposed to pretty much all medical interventions, childbirth may be a unique situation where the experience of what called pain, contractions, surges, whatever you want to call it, it's painful, might have positive as well as negative hormonal effects. And I think we need to remember that when we do an intervention which changes those hormones. So the common themes of our presenters were that alternative settings are associated with decreased interventions high transfer rates, and apparently an increased neonatal risk with home delivery. Let's take a look at that. There are several studies that suggest home birth is associated with increased neonatal mortality. Dr. Wax's meta-analysis has been previously mentioned. These are heterogeneous studies from different countries at different time periods and done in different ways, but end up saying that there's a two to three-fold increase in neonatal mortality, although the absolute incidence is low. There's another study in, in this country, which I found actually a bit more compelling, which is one single study done by Dr. Malloy. He looked at more than 1.3 million births with linked birth and death certificates in the United States. He compared midwife attended births at home versus midwife attended births in the hospital and found a consistent with Dr. Wax's meta-analysis increase in neonatal mortality. Now, as you know, Birth death certificate linking is flawed. You don't have intent, you don't have this, you don't have that, but it is a consistent finding with the previous one. Dr. Simon in the British Medical Journal looked at the independent midwife service versus the National Health Service. There was an increase in perinatal mortality with the independent midwife service of whom about two-thirds delivered at home, although 90% had intended to. But when they tried to count it down to what they considered low risk, then they found no difference in low-risk pregnancies for neonatal mortality. Why? Lots of different answers to that question, I'm sure. Is there a difference in education, training, and equipment? The fact that we have more equipment in the hospital means we use that equipment more. I mean, that, that's pretty clear. That's pretty consistent. Is there a difference in the education, training, and equipment available to home birth practitioners? Is it, in the end, a high-risk situation that's not appropriate for home? Is it an irreconcilable problem with transport in an emergency? You know, you, there's this 30-minute C-section rule that they've been re-looking at. Is there an inescapable, unavoidable problem with emergencies that far away from the hospital? Or is it conceivably a system failure, since we don't think we really have a system? I wanted to show you one more study. This is home birth in a unified system. This is a Canadian model of practice. It's from British Columbia. And in this system, registered midwives are mandated to offer home or hospital care to women who meet very specifically defined safety criteria. In this study, they compared planned home birth, matched to hospital birth with midwife, matched to hospital birth with MD. 79% of the women who planned to deliver at home did deliver at home for a transport rate of about one in five. There were fewer interventions, which is consistent with previous, and there was no increase 
in baby morbidities or mortality. Their perinatal death rate was quite low in all settings, speaking to their ability to look at low risk in a pretty good way. So from that, the final thing I'd like to present you is we have gaps in research, and we have gaps all over the place. But one major exam example is still astonishing to me, and that is in pain control. This is from a Cochrane review done just last year. A major challenge in compiling this overview is the variation in use of different process and outcome measures in different trials, particularly assessment of pain and its relief and the effects on the neonate after birth. In this, they say, despite concerns for 30 years or more about the effects of maternal opioid administration during labor on subsequent neonatal behavior and its influence on breastfeeding, only two of the 57 trials of opioids reported breastfeeding as an outcome. And epidural analgesia, another pain control measure. This is from the CDC in the uh, 27 U.S. states that had the, the uh, unified birth certificate in practice in 2008. And the overall incidence of epidural analgesia was 61% of all births, and it varied from 22% to 78% in the different states that were reported. In Europe, the rates reported are generally less than 50% and, and generally well under 50%. So there's a tremendous variability. It does relieve pain. This is a statement from ACOG saying there are no other circumstances in which it is considered acceptable for an individual to experience untreated severe pain amenable to safe intervention while under a physician's care. However, there's no free lunch. It does increase maternal fever, hypotension, length of second stage, assisted vaginal delivery, C-section for fetal distress, and urinary retention. And that's not to mention neonatal outcomes after epidural. So the problem is, how do we assess our interventions? We have two patients. What may be good for one might not be so good for the other. We have myriad outcomes. Can you imagine the Bonferroni correction looking at 100 different outcomes? And we don't know what risk outweighs what benefits. We have such variability in what those risks are and what they entail and what they mean for lifelong events for the, for the baby in particular. We can look at outcome measures that are physiologic or biochemical. We can look at home birth versus hospital for the sweat cortisols or salivary cortisols. We can look at it on that day and then two days later. But we have to tie that. We have to link that to some other kind of an outcome. If, if, if there's a change in cortisol, it may or may not mean anything. We can look at short-term outcomes that are of importance to mothers and others, such as successful breastfeeding. And I would put to you, uh, particularly with the developmental origins of adult disease, that it's not just important to that individual mother. Breastfeeding is important to us as a society. We can look at longer-term outcomes, but I tell you that's expensive. It's hard to do. And 15 years later, you're just praying that you chose the right outcome. So. I would echo Dr. Sakala, who says, it's important to distinguish what is known, incompletely known, and completely unknown as we go forward, and to be sure and distinguish that from what we are sure we already know. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists and the discussant for a absolutely great uh, discussion of the evidence. So we have 15 minutes to go out and ponder over the water cooler what we're going to ask when we come back in here. <laughs> so please come back at 10 after 3 for uh, a lively discussion of, of what we've just heard. <laughs>